As an instructor, I can tell you firsthand, I've seen the difficult and often intimidating tasks students face in filing their first FOIA request. Students often have to jump through extra hurdles to gain access to public information, from requesting a FOIA fee waiver to sorting through the maze of endless exemptions. Does any of this sound familiar? Yeah, you're nodding your head. To the all too familiar yet frustrating sound of a FOIA officer's <coughs> silence. Today we will hear from four talented students who have successfully navigated the murky waters of the Freedom of Information Act. Our guests will walk us through the unique challenges they face as student journalists and how their experience has shaped their work moving forward. Joining us are Rachel Hinton. Ms. Hinton is the managing editor of DePaul University's student-run newspaper and has led several investigations into campus sexual assault. Peter Grieve is an editor of this news section of the University of Chicago's independent student newspaper. And he recently broke a story on campus sexual assault and another on fraternity hazing. Megan Bennett served as the associate editor and campus editor for the Columbia Chronicle. And she's also worked for CBS's Special Projects and Investigative Unit, where she filed several FOIA requests. Nader Issa is the managing editor of The Phoenix, Loyola University student-run newspaper. He is also a Metro Desk intern at the Chicago Sun-Times and a former investigations intern at the Better Government Association. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Each student will now walk us through a FOIA case, and I encourage students to ask any questions. I want this to be as organic as possible. I want a lot of dialogue. So if an idea comes to you or a question comes to you while a student is talking and you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Ms. Hinton, why don't you begin? Sure. So DePaul University is a private school, just a little south of here. Uh, the Loop campuses, the other campuses in Lincoln Park. Um, so that presents a lot of challenges for people like me who know that the university is doing something but can't necessarily find all of the documents it needs to support that. Um, so the biggest things for me um, are finding, I guess, um, model schools that are similar to DePaul. Uh, with sexual assault, it's a little bit different because the school is not necessarily going to tell you this is how many sexual assaults have happened, this is where they've happened, this is their names, or these are their names. Um, but filing FOIAs through uh, the Chicago Police Department, in, and even though those names might be redacted, um, figuring out people at different dorms where the sexual assaults have happened and going to those dorms and connecting to people there or connecting through like different channels, like other journalists who might work in the same department as I do or people I meet in class. Um, so filing FOIAs for me through my school is difficult, but obviously there are different channels to take um, to make sure that you get the information you need. CPD has been super helpful. I'm on like a weird first name basis with Anthony Buglimi now. Um, I, I totally recommend finding different routes. Uh, the school isn't necessarily going to be helpful. The school doesn't want you to know anything about what it's doing really, especially private schools because it doesn't have to answer a lot of those questions. Um, so talking to CPD if you're covering like sexual assault, um, talking to different groups on campus. Um, the feminist front at our school last year was very vocal about different things, uh, especially in regards to sexual assault, and knowing the president of that organization, um, as well as a few other people there, really helped me get my second story done. Um, as well as knowing professors, knowing experts around the city who, even though you may not necessarily be able to file a FOIA, will tell you the information you need to know or we'll tell you different ways or different places uh, to look. So Frank Lamonte of the Student Press Law Center, I don't know how many of you know him, um, also a really great guy, also a really great person to reach out to. Um, he really helped me as well in my stories. Any questions? Um, Ms. Hinton, can you talk a little bit more about um, filing your first FOIA request and what was that like? What email language did you use and what was the response and then how did you react? Sure. Um, my first FOIA wasn't for, I guess, sexual assault. It was for DePaul recently announced its new president. Um, I wanted to know how much money the school had spent on the search firm to find that new president. So I sent a FOIA to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign because they've used the same search firm multiple times and I wanted to get like an estimate or like a, a similarity. Um, so for that, I 
sent out my FOIA to University of UIUC, um, University of Illinois at Springfield, University of Illinois at Chicago to get like a general understanding because they all use them. Um, so that was my first FOIA. It, they say five days, like by five days they should respond to you. Um, that wasn't the case for me. I had to call, I had to be persistent, I had to track down the right person. Um, and like that's another thing I'd recommend is knowing who to talk to. Um, and then also I had to refine my FOIA a couple of times because they kept saying like the amount of information you're requesting, uh, it would take us like X amount of days and we don't have like the manpower to do it. So I was trying to be helpful and I cut down the, the things I used <coughs> or the things I was looking for. Um, so the language I used was, um, you know, pursuant to Freedom of Information Act of Illinois, blah, 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 blah. I am requesting all uh, documents pertaining to, you know, this search firm in the year uh, 2013, comma, 2015, comma, 2016, or something like that. Um, and I did that for each of the schools that I requested the information from. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I guess I'll tell this story one first for our request. Um, so I was a freshman uh, writing for you know, the student newspaper at the University of Chicago. Um, and I guess it was just like a busy time, like finals week or something. Uh, and my editors couldn't find like a more experienced reporter. But so they say, hey Pete, uh, there's this Facebook group called Overheard at U Chicago. Um, and I'm sure like other campuses have similar things, but it's, it's like the biggest Facebook community uh, for the school, lots of students. Um, and so two women within a period of two days the first woman posts um, details about uh, sexual assault, um, and she's the victim uh, in the case uh, at Psi Epsilon Fraternity on campus. Um, and you know, she sort of tells her story because I guess people were, were talking about it on Yik Yak, um, and that got under her skin. And she felt like there was misinformation going around, so she wanted to just set the record straight. Um, so she posts information about her story on Overheard. Um, then the next day, another uh, victim comes forward, says that uh, she was sexually assaulted by uh, a member of the same fraternity, um, you know, within a period of a few months. So that was sort of took campus by storm. Two two cases, two days on this Facebook page. Um, everyone was talking about it, uh, and and so. I didn't know what I was doing at all. I don't even think I knew what the Freedom of Information Act was at the time. Um, but I sent an email to uh, a reporter who had recently graduated and had covered uh, sexual assault cases for our newspaper in the past. Um, and he was like, yeah, you got to fi file a FOIA request. This is how you do it. I don't think he really knew what he was doing either, because he was like, you have to mail it in. And it's going to take 30 days, but that's limited. <laughs> I realized you can send an email and it would be much faster, so that's what we did. Um, Perhaps the most interesting thing about that was uh, one of the women in her Facebook post said that she got a call um, from the owner of the fraternity, um, just like on her cell phone, asking her to give him the name of uh, her perpetrator. So that that was confusing to us because we were like, okay, how did this guy get her phone number? Um, and so when we talked to the the, the president sorry, the owner of the fraternity house, he said he uh, contacted an alum of the fraternity who works for the CPD, um, I guess a lieutenant with the CPD, and asked for uh, a police report. So he got a police report that way, um, and it wasn't fully redacted. So it, it had like personal information, including the victim's phone number. Um, so the question we had was, what, what were we going to get when we filed this Freedom of Information Act um, with CPD? And what, what we got, I mean, it was just all crossed out, all black, no, no name, no phone number. Um, so that was interesting because clearly, like, this CPD lieutenant who was the one of the fraternity had, had given, uh, you know, personal identification information uh, that he wasn't really supposed to be giving out. So that was, you know, that was, what, what, what we didn't get from that Freedom of Information Act request was actually more interesting than anything that was in it because everything was crossed out. <coughs> Interesting. And what surprised you the most, Peter, during that process? What made you go, wow, I can't believe this is actually? I mean, I don't know. It wasn't that surprising. Like, in, I guess, you know, it was frustrating just to, to like, we probably put, delayed our story like 10 days waiting for this request. Um, we're like, okay, like, we want to tell the full story. Um, there's already information out there, but it's not hugely time sensitive. We'll wait to see what we get. Um, from the CPD and then you know nothing comes back and we could publish 10 days ago and we already had all the information that was in there. So that was a little bit frustrating. Um, but no huge surprises, I would say. And so how did you perceive the story? 
we published. Like <laughs> at that point, we knew there wasn't much more we were gonna get. We'd already inter like done the interviews we needed to do, um, and we had the information that we were gonna be able to get. And so, did you ever receive information from? I mean, so we, we got you know it, it's it's like age male, but that's about it. Like ever all the and I, I was looking at it before this panel, and just really nothing in there other than. Um, what CPD News Affairs can give you in like their their email uh, statements like 30 minutes after you send it. So there wasn't there really wasn't anything in in what they gave us at all in those redacted police reports. Okay, really good. Okay. Um, so obviously, like um, Peter and Rachel said, there it's really hard, especially at um, at private colleges, to get information because they're not required to give you anything. Um, so as far as for my student newspaper, it's always been hard to get information for any story we've been working on. Um, Rachel brought up an interesting point about going to other public universities and um, do a, submitting a FOIA for similar information. That's something that we've done before for stories that's been really helpful. Um, the most interesting thing for me that I've found is um, working at an internship. So I was at the Better Government Association, which is like a government watchdog investigations group um, in Chicago and they investigate uh, government, uh, politics, corruption in Chicago and Illinois. Um, and what I found is interesting is that employers, if you're going to an internship, they realize the problems that we face as students. And it's almost like they take um, those problems and they put them aside so that they can still get what they need to get done. So as an intern, they're not really necessarily going to let you submit a FOIA, you're not going to get the experience that you necessarily want uh, in, in submitting a FOIA. So there is a story um, I helped on. It was about an official with O'Hare. Um, she had worked with a consulting firm, and then she moved to um, O'Hare Airport. She's a Cook County official. And um, the BGA was suspecting that she was granting um, deals, business deals, to her old firm instead of uh, instead of offering a fair, I guess, uh, a fair deal to any other um, consulting firm. So I helped work on the FOIA, but they didn't let me submit it from my email or under my name because they knew if the FOIA officer saw that it was an intern, they might not get back to me right away. They might not give me the information um, that they necessarily wanted. So. It's just a struggle as far as being a student, even if you're working at a big um, organization, that's a professional organization, you still might not get to do the things you want to do. Okay, very good. Um, so, um, same problem everyone has. My colleagues are private institutions, so um, if I send in a request to the news office or asking for information about, um, you know, fa faculty and staff complaints or, um, you know, some sort of sexual assault, we hardly hear anything back as well. I think that the only time we've gone outside of the college in recent years to um, submit a FOIA request was for um, some union problems. We our um, part-time faculty union um, is very vocal with their and they're very uh, uh, quick to send you know federal complaints and, and file federal lawsuits against the college when it comes to um, staff getting their or faculty getting their classes taken away or. Um, that they feel like that the economic freedom is being compromised. So I helped about a year ago with um, going to the uh, federal NLRB and asking for all of the um, complaints from the part-time faculty union to the college in the past, I think five or, five or 10 years or so. And that, they um, obviously were really helpful. Um, there's not really many secrets to be had, but they had to um, keep getting extensions because they couldn't make the 30 days because um, there was hundreds and hundreds of pages and names had to be redacted and stuff like that. So we only probably ended up getting about 70 pages in the amount of time that they were able to work with that. And it was, just, it, we didn't really post a story with it, but it was just some good background information to have for future stories to see um, how they operate and what kind of um, people have filed federal lawsuits or what kind of federal lawsuits they've been doing before. Um, but yeah, like you, I did a, some FOIA requests when I worked at CBS and um, they had me do more of the low level FOIA requests, like the um, calling of like small Chicagoland suburbs and asking about certain businesses in the area, seeing if, uh, I think one of them was like um, the number of businesses a certain neighborhood had um, that 
make the food that go in airplanes. <laughs> so I did that, but they wouldn't let me do another one with the CPD um, either about like how many people have filed lawsuits, of, or not lawsuits, how many people have filed um, like criminal charges against people that um, dogs bite, people's dogs that bite them. And that, that was never even answered and they never even responded to that one. So, and that was done by the producer and uh, another one of the uh, reporters. So yeah, I was really surprised to see how like the one that I did where it was like a smaller area, like had less things to do, it took I think like a day. And the one that um, we did with the uh, NLRB and the uh, Chicago Police Department took I think, like months. So it's really interesting to see how it varies from place to place. You talked about interacting with and filing for you with the CPD, which is always an interesting experience. Can you talk a little bit, a little bit about them? And I want each of you to chime in on what was the most frustrating experience you had, and then how did you resolve it? Um, I think the most frustrating experience I had um, is more so trying to get information from the college through a similar, um, I, I, whenever I file similar requests with the college, I try and follow the same FOIA format request, um, and doing that, I ask for, you know, specific years, like I need this information from 2005, 2015, or 2006 to 2007, um, and then I ask for, um, I think the one example I can think of is I asked for all of the colleges like raw data for uh, race and gender like makeup of the full-time faculty and the full-time staff over a certain kind of time and just because it's a private institution uh, they can just literally say no if even if you do it the exact way that you're supposed to so I've never really had um, an issue with you know filing FOIA requests with you know um, public bodies or, or government bodies it's more with the private institutions that can't um, they don't have to answer you even if you do it correctly. And how did you work around that? Um, well, that one, they, I just kept asking, <laughs> and they never were able to give um, me the information in a timely manner, but they do publish it um, like six months later on the college's website, so I just had to wait. And I had to get what I could, um, which was like about five years worth of data, and then I just put in the story that um, they declined to give any other information. Okay, very good. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think um, most students, if their FOIA request was denied or, um, you know, they were asked for more information, would give up. You know, what made all of you persist? Because yes, I persist. think that's really important. That you not, all four of you kept going with it. I guess I can go. Uh, it, usually when we've had to submit a FOIA request or, um, like she just talked about, try to get information from a private college that's not going to give you information, a lot of times it's for a really big story. So if, if it's for a big story, it's something that we know needs to be reported. And so usually that's the motivation to keep going. Because uh, if there's a sexual assault on campus that we need information about, we're not just going to stop and not report on the sexual assault. So it's, it's usually something that we know needs to be reported on. So we try to move past being students that are going to be ignored and try to get the information. I also think just journalists are naturally very stubborn people. Yeah. Um, so I think just with that will to just kind of win is is one of those things. I just yeah tell a story the way it's supposed to be told because at one point it's not about you. It's about just um, people that are reading it. So that's also I know it's really frustrating, but someone has to do it eventually. So. Well, good for all of you. Though. I do. I want to applaud you um, for you know persisting with these stories. Rachel or Peter, do you want to add to Patty's question? I would say being stubborn is the main thing. Um, I'm a very stubborn person just in general. But I think, you know, being told no or being told like you have to refine and refine and refine just makes me like a little angry, so I try to turn that anger into persistence. Yes? Uh, I was wondering uh, for your internships, why they didn't momentarily, like temporarily strip you of your intern title instead of, you know, when you're filing. You, there's no reason why you have to identify as an yeah. intern, how come they didn't let you say you were a reporter or a staffer or something like As far that? as the BGA goes, and I can't talk for CBS obviously, but for the BGA, um, when I was there, they were having some staff turnover, um, and so, and the BGA submits FOIA requests every day, they, like, all the time they're submitting FOIAs, so the, the organizations, or the, um, if it's CPD or O'Hare, Cook County, anything, they know who works at the BGA. And for us, it was as simple as that, as they know 
who the director of investigations is, who the um, two investigators are, the lead investigators. So they, they knew the staff there. So I can't speak about other organizations, but for us, even like stripping my title, they would have wondered who I was and they would know that I wasn't one of the um, usual investigators. Yeah. For me, I actually didn't say I was an intern immediately, but in my email signature it says that, so they would have found out eventually. Um, but I don't, I, like I just said, I work for CBS and I'm doing a story on X, Y, and Z. Um, and so it actually wasn't really them not trusting me, like, or them worrying about the outside party seeing that I was an intern. They did, for certain FOIAs, they just did it by themselves because they, they knew the way that it needed to go. Um, some of the more low-level ones that were just easier, like, can be done in five minutes were the ones that I was able to do just because, I think, um, you know, they, they know their story better than anyone. <laughs> I want to talk to you about interactions with the FOIA officer because that is always one of the most intimidating things for students to do is to like actually write that first email to a FOIA officer or pick up the phone and talk to them. Does anyone want to talk about their experience? Yes, I mean, so for emails, I've just always used like uh, I, you, the Student Press Law Center has like a great generator, um, so I've just used that language. Um, but then in terms of like correspondence over the phone, like I got a call the other day. Uh, we filed a request to the Department of Education for uh, any Title IX athletics complaints um, because we thought there was one and there was. Uh, but yeah, so she she like calls me and says um, because we the language you use like was any and all records related to complaints within the past two years. Um, she's like, this is going to take us a really long time to do. Uh, I would suggest that you narrow it to. Uh, any any complaints and letters of acknowledgement. So that's she she talked me into doing that, um, and that's what we got. And it, she turned it on in like five days, which was nice. Um, but I mean, the problem there is like there there are a lot more records that we now need, so that the clock sort of starts over. Um, so it, it felt it felt to me like she was sort of, sort of like trying to 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 talk me out of like requesting everything that I actually wanted, um, sort of so that she could reset that clock. And then she was also saying like, can you just like give me consent uh, to redact everything and that'll like speed up the process? And I was like, I was like, what? So I just played dumb and I was like, probably not. Like I'd have to talk to my editor first. Um, and she she seemed pissed off, but like it it ended up working out. So I, I do feel like when they sort of get the student journalist on the phone, they're like, okay, we can bully him around. He doesn't know what he's doing. Um, so that, yeah, that is a little frustrating. And you tapped into something about assumptions about student journalists. And I just want to hear from everyone else about their interactions with the FOIA officer. What kind of assumptions do you think were made when you said, I'm a student reporter, or I'm an intern? Usually when I have to talk to people, um, they get a little like condescending. Or like the first time it's a little condescending or like a lot of pushback. And then like subsequent conversations are a lot more of like, not that we're on the same level, but I feel like slightly more respected. Um, so for a story I'm doing for a class, I'm writing about like homicide closure rates in the state and in certain cities, and I've had to talk to the, I guess, FOIA officer for the Illinois State Police a lot of times. And our first conversation, she like yelled at me for a long time, saying like, I didn't understand how government works, I didn't understand what I could request. And I was like on my computer like looking up what can I re request for FOIA, and literally everything I asked for was like on the list. Um, so I was like, no, I can request all of this information, depending on how long you need, like, we can talk that out, but, like, no, I'm totally within my right to do this. Um, so, like, that was our first conversation, like, three weeks ago. Um, I've gotten subsequent, like, emails back saying, like, oh, we're whittling it down, like, can we talk again? And, like, our conversations from then on have been not, I guess, yelling back and forth. Um, <laughs> they're a little more, like, cordial, but there's still a lot of uh, tension there. So I, I would say that that's the main theme of like all of my conversations with FOIA officers is like tension, tension and yelling. stuff. Yeah. Yes. Um, Richard, what is the first piece of advice you would give to a student journalist who has never filed a FOIA request? I would say talk to a professor. Um, there's a professor we have named Jason Martin who teaches like a law and ethics class. Um, he did like a whole week kind of on FOIA, um, and since then he's been the person I go to. Um, also, I just kind of trained myself, so if you type in like FOIA Illinois, um, I think the Medill Justice Project has like a great write-up on like, these are your rights, this is what you can ask for, this is what you can do, this is what you can pursue if like you're denied, or um, if they restrict your information or if they redact too much. Um, so I would say it's a lot of, 
you know, reaching out to like the proper channels within your school, but also like doing research on your own. So like staying up till like three kind of, like <laughs> looking up FOIA, not maybe till three, but like, you know, looking at FOIA and like educating yourself as well. Peter, what do you think? On that question? Yeah. So, I mean, that's been hard for me because we don't have a journalism major. Um, so there aren't, like, journalism professors uh, who I can go to. So it's always just been, like, um, talking to uh, older reporters, reporters who graduated, um, alums who are, like, working for professional media companies. Um, I've, like, reached out to Tribune reporters and said, hey, can you help me out on this? So just any, anyone who can advise you, really. Um, definitely what uh, Rachel talked about is professors. Um, and even, they, they might even have like a template you can start off with. You won't want to use that the rest of your career, but you can at least get started and get an idea of what a FOIA request looks like. Um, and also know going in that it's going to take a while. And if, so like when I was at the BGA, I didn't always get to submit the FOIA request, but after I helped um, work on the initial request, they would give me the what came of it, which was like 5,000 pages of PDFs that they wanted me to look through. <laughs> so then w when I'm looking at that, I'm looking at the email and there's like 20 emails back and forth. That, that's the email thread. So know that it's gonna take a while and there's going to be back and forth like uh, Rachel talked about. Um, for me, I would definitely say if you haven't already enrolled in some sort of media ethics class or some sort of media law class, I would do that ASAP because that's where I learned about FOIAs for the first time. Not for the first time, but that's how I learned how to kind of perfect to FOIA. Um, so my class at Columbia, we, um, one of our assignments was to create a FOIA and if we chose to submit it, um, we would also report how that worked out. Um, so we first made mock FOIA and she would grade us on how um, she thinks that it would be received by whatever organization you were working for or looking for information from. Um, so that's also a great place to start, but also um, I think specificity is the real like key. I've never um, sent a FOIA without um, knowing what kind of documents I'm looking for and listing all those kind of documents out, as well as giving a time frame. Um, so I want these types of documents from this point in time to this point in time, or this point in time to present, um, and make sure it's not uh, like too, like, like 1970 to present um, for like sexual assault story or sexual assaults in Chicago would not be good. Um, but like maybe like sexual assaults that happened um, on these blocks in this point in time, you can do like the blocks that like Loyola camp, college campus uh, dorms are on uh, from 2010 to present. Like that's the kind of thing. Um, um, so when you do submit your request and they actually get back to you and they're actually cooperative instead of you know, like yeah. I do for Arizona. Um, so if they get back to you and they give you, and they sort of take the easy way out, so for example, she gives you all of this information that you want, um, rather than making it more condensed for you, um, have you guys ever dealt with a situation like that? Slash how would you, how are, and, and if you have, how have you uh, dealt with that? Like if you have an officer and they're just being lazy and they don't, they want you to spend um, like 63 hours going through 30 pages of information. How would you deal with that? I've had the opposite problem. Not yeah, yeah I was going to say, so. I don't think they usually, I don't think you're ever going to get a FOIA officer that's like, oh, your request is too broad, so I'm going to give you all of this information. They're usually going to keep trying to get it to narrow down um, so that they give you less information than what you want. Yeah, so for the for the union example for my school, we went to the to find the federal filings. They um, only were able to give us like less than 100 pages because they went back and back and forth saying there's like hundreds and hundreds of pages here, and we're not going to give you all of these. So tell us what what amount do you want? And so it, it just kind of nailed down to I'm not going to give you everything. So tell me how much you want. <laughs> This is a very good conversation. I want to go back to um, interactions with the FOIA officer because I, um, Rachel and Peter had a chance to respond, but I just want to get thoughts from Nader and from uh, Megan. Um, I don't think interacting with a FOIA officer is any different than interacting with uh, any administrator at a college campus or um, anyone in charge of something that you're trying to get information from. When they see that you're a student reporter, almost 
all the time. They're going to be condescending. They're not going to want to give you information. They're not going to give you respect. Um, like as as far as a FOIA officer, I don't. I can't think off the top of my head of any like really really negative interactions I've had. Um, but like with an administrator at Loyola, I was working on a a, a story um, last year. And it, it turned out to be a really big story, but when we first started talking to the administrator, our first uh, initial meeting with him, we sit down and he says, oh, like, you guys have your little notepads and all. And, like, he was, like, extremely condescending to us. Um, so I, I don't think it's any different with a FOIA officer than it is with any administrator. As soon as they see you're a student reporter, they're not going to want to even work with you because they think you're not capable. Yes. Who is that administrator? I can't say. Oh, well. <laughs> I had to ask. Um, yeah, I would say I'm, um, I've never had a particularly unpleasant interaction with a FOIA officer. I've probably done you know less FOIAs than how you guys have with your college paper. But um, yeah, I would say the same thing. Like The only really negative interactions I've had with, is with trying to get information from a private institution. Um, and it's just, it's always, and even if it's information that uh, you feel like it, it's going to be public later, it's just like trying to get a head start on that. I know we were one time requesting um, the college form 990s from the current year. They always do it a year behind, and um, the current year would have the sal full salaries of like seven or eight of our administrators, while the former year would only have about half their salary um, because Columbia's kind of got a revolving <coughs> door of. Um, administrators quit or, or fired, um, but they said they wouldn't give that away, um, like during the present year, even though it was good, it was made public like six months later. So things like that, where it's just that's the really big uh, hurdles. They're the ones that are more secretive because they can't be, and they're more rude about it because they can't be. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the importance of. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, just yeah, really quick question for Nader. Um, how do you deal with condescending? Um, in my experience, you you pretend like it doesn't affect you, um, and remain professional because if they see that you're, even if they're talking down to you or patronizing, being patronizing, and you remain professional and keep going at it, they're going to see that yeah, there is a story there, and they're not quitting, and they're like everyone's talked about today, they're being stubborn. Um, so just remaining professional and. Even though you're a student reporter acting like a pro professional reporter, will at least start to gain some respect from them. Good. Let's talk about the importance of research and prep before you actually make your FOIA request because I think that's a very important step. It's almost like contacting the FOIA officer is your last step, not your first. So, Rachel, why don't you um, weigh in on that? Sure. So, I guess. Before I file anything or like ask the school for any information or anything like that, um, I'll always go through like news reports. Lexis Nexus is really cool in that regard because it has like news clips from like way back in the day. Um, so like I'll go through and see if anything's been written about what I'm looking for, and then sometimes I'll contact like people who've written about those things, or I'll like kind of bookmark that for later so that I can come back to it when requesting information. So if like a sexual assault happened like October 16th, 2015, I know like, okay, I want to start my record search in 2015, maybe to present. Um, so it, it really helps me to look at like news clips as well as um, like in rape on campus is like a really big uh, organization that deals with sexual assault and trying to end that on campus. They put out like different reports and, and you know, their organization is really vocal um, about like statistics and things like that. So it helps you know, having that in my pocket too so that I, if I do have to talk to a FOIA officer, I know, like, okay, actually, like, this is the stat that I'm, like, requesting or, like, looking at. Um, yeah, it, it always helps to, like, know what you're going after and, like, know, I guess, or, like, anticipate what people might say back to you. Um, yeah, like, that's, I guess, what my biggest uh, experience is. Very good, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, so, I mean, one thing is you, you want to do research before because, you know, these things do take time and you don't want to wait 20 days for a request to come back and then realize you requested the wrong thing and have to start over, especially if you're on deadlines. So, it's important in that aspect. But the other thing I would say is, like, 
you don't always have to be reactionary, right? Like you don't have to wait for um, something to happen to, to prompt you like, to say, hey, oh, I should maybe file a FOIA request. Like you can just, you can file the FOIA request not knowing what you're looking for. Like this Title IX athletics thing that I was just talking about, like you can, I, I would encourage like other newspapers, other colleges to see what, to see if any Title IX athletics complaints have been filed because that's like gonna be an interesting story if your university was investigated. Um, we just filed a FOIA request for any Clary Act uh, viol violations, complaints. I don't even really know what the Clary Act does, but it's like the campus safety. Um, it, re it like requires universities to report like certain statistics. Um, so if they're not reporting those statistics, they can be investigated. Um, so you can just like be proactive, do research, try to figure out like what kinds of things um, you can request. Because it, obviously private institutions, we can't. There's like a, like a lot we can't. But when universities interact with the federal government, like there's going to be um, stuff that's that's public and that we can get access to. So like I think doing research to figure out what report, what what kinds of requests you can actually file is like definitely worthwhile. Um, and, and I mentioned this before. There's you're going to have a lot of back and forth with the FOIA officer when you're requesting information. So doing your research and knowing exactly what you want instead of starting off too broad will help you cut down the time and the amount of back and forth uh, that you have. So if you go in knowing, like these guys said, if you go in knowing exactly what you want, uh, th they might still say it's too broad for them or try to work around it, but it, it'll at least give you a better head start to getting to the actual uh, documents you want at the end. Uh, I would just echo what you said about like researching what you can find without going through the FOIA office. I think that um, as student journalists, they're already expecting you to not have done your research beforehand. Um, so if there's anything that you can find um, online or through uh, public documents that you can get on your own, I would do that first. Um, an example I can think of is um, we were trying to find uh, the president of our school's former salary um, at his public institution, and instead of having to go through a FOIA request for that, we were just able to find it online. Um, if we had submitted a FOIA request for that, we would have looked to the student. Um, so things like that, um, whatever you can find on the internet or um, through another better verified source would be um, ideal first, because they're not expecting you to do that. Uh, let's talk about the dreaded exemption. Who wants to walk us through an exemption that they had to uh, reply to? And then how did you? What was the exemption? And then walk us through how you responded. Oh wow, you're lucky. Does anyone have to deal with exemptions? No. Oh wow, lucky, lucky, I've, lucky. I've had exemptions, but okay. I've just done nothing at that point. Like, we don't have a legal advisor. We don't have a lawyer. I don't like at that point. I don't really know what we can do. Um, so I mean, it's I understand there's like some sort of appeal process you can go through, but I've yes. never done that. Oh, you're really lucky. Okay, good, good, good. Is there anyone in the audience who has filed a FOIA and wants to talk about their experience as well? Okay, so. So I, I was actually filing um, FOIAs this time last year, so it's been a while. Um, just in regards to um, my conversations with the officers themselves, um, I think um, uh, one of you two earlier said that uh, you said that you received calls from your officer. Um, that was, they will reach out to you. Um, and it's nice to see that they will act that they will accommodate your needs as well. Um, I noticed that my first um, introductory email to the officer in terms of what I'm looking for, uh, my end goal, things of that nature, time limits, and everything like that. Um, if I if I'm if um, I'm able to add something, I think the first email you send to an officer um, to really shatter their preconceived notions of oh you're a student reporter you don't. You haven't done your research, you're not acclimated, etc. The first introductory email you make is extremely, extremely important because um, if that's crisp, uh, clear cut, things like that, um, I noticed that when I did that, and that when I did that to five or seven FOIA officers, they will all work with me um, a lot better. They treated me with decency and respect. Um, so, yeah, so I had an overall very, very good experience. Good, good, good. Anyone else? Is anyone else about a FOIA you want to talk about? No? Okay, one more question. Um, let's talk about, I, I like what you said, Rachel, about anticipating. I want each of you to talk about that. How did you anticipate when you found a very, what you knew to be a very difficult FOIA? How did you prepare for that? 
Yeah, so I, when I sent my FOIA for like my class project or even for like different things I've done for the paper, um, I've always tried to find, like have a plan B is I guess the biggest thing that I've been told and also that I try to do. So I'll anticipate like this taking a week or two weeks more than I expected. So I'll try to find what I need in different ways. Um, so if that's like uh, rape statistics on campus or you know sexual assaults happening on campuses like DePaul's, um, I'll try to have that as like backup information so at least I can reference that in the article if I can't get you know uh, some report from CPD. Um, with like the homicide case that I'm working on, it's a little more difficult because it's like a whole state. Um, and so it, it makes it harder to, to do that. But I anticipated some pushback because um, I read online that this woman who's in charge of the Illinois State Police like FOIA office is difficult to work with. Um, so again, like research um, is, is essential. You wouldn't walk into an interview like with no questions and with no idea of what you're gonna talk about. So I, I would apply the same thing to a FOIA as well. Can you talk about that case that you're working on? Sure. Um, just like FOIA-wise? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've sent four FOIAs related to like the same uh, article. Um, I sent one to like the Illinois State Police and then uh, a couple to like other cities. Um, I filed one for Joliet and they do actually require that like you go in person or like mail it into them. Um, so I'm still waiting for like results um, on that one. But overall, um, like I haven't really gotten any information back from the state or from like the places I FOIA for, but because of you know FBI stats that the state does report, I have a vague understanding of what's going on. Um, so yeah, like I've been using databases and experts and attorneys um, and even like mayors of these cities to really have a better understanding of my story before I get my information back. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean. I don't know if this answers your question, but I, I guess sort of going back to something that was said, like, we are student journalists and, like, y you might get the condescending FOIA officer, but, like, y you should also know that, like, they're going to, they're doing what they have to do, and, like, I think that goes for, you know, basically how we act, interact with, like, a lot of people, like, you want to be polite, but, like, if you don't send the perfect email, like, they, they still have to comply with your request, um, so I, I, th I think you should just go in knowing that, and, like, yeah, maybe your boss didn't want you to send the email because you're an intern and they thought you'd have better luck if like they had a reporter doing it. But like, they're gonna do what they have to do. Like, you can you can be upfront and like, but still just anticipate that it's gonna get there and don't just sort of expect that you're not gonna get um, the same thing that Tribune would get if they're if they're sending in a request. Like, I think you should expect that they're gonna comply with the law and everything, um, and, and go in with that sort of frame of mind. Um, I think basically anticipate everything we've talked about today is that as student reporters, no matter what it is, whether it's um, a FOIA, trying to find a source for a story, you're going to have problems getting what you want. Um, and when you're submitting a FOIA, it's no different. You're going to have problems. Um, you, you can anticipate and should anticipate that they're going to comply with the law and give you what you want. But you also need to have a backup plan, need to know that stuff might not always happen the way you want. Um, so n just anticipate having to work through problems and um, ending up to, to getting what you want. Uh, I think just anticipating that it may not be the uh, like big breakthrough you're looking for. Um, sometimes FOIAs are really helpful, sometimes FOIAs I kind of confirm that maybe a story isn't great, or maybe a story might just not be the one you're looking for. Um, I know one at CBS I did, they completed the FOIA so quickly because everything I was looking for um, didn't necessarily exist, or like the business I was looking for were in a different city, so they're like, actually, it's not here, so you might want to try somewhere else. Um, and then one of the ones we did as a newspaper, we only got like maybe you know, 70 pages, and we only looked at them, you know, a handful of times because it wasn't everything we were looking for. and. Uh, wasn't anything we hadn't seen before. So, uh, you know, just like, it may not be the biggest, uh, like, juicy story you're looking for, but I mean, there's other avenues to go through in these stories. So, uh, just knowing in mind, like, don't necessarily rely on a FOIA all the time. Um, and, and that's an interesting distinction. That, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What stories might require a FOIA versus what, versus what stories may not in the interest of deadlines? Yeah, so, um, 
mean, if you're doing a story on uh, you know sexual assault, of course you want to get the FOIA. Um, but if you're trying to like make a giant investigation into like the college, if it happened this one time, maybe it's probably happened like dozens of times. Like we need to look into this, and you find out through a FOIA that's only happened the one time. It may not be that big breakthrough story you're looking for. It, it's just one very unfortunate story, but it's not you know, necessarily a full like six week investigation like you might have thought. Things like that. Do we have any other questions? I know there's a lot of information here. Yes, Jessica? So, what would you want your faculty or advisors to tell you or say to you to help encourage you to begin this process, or if you get stuck or you stumble? Like, what's the best thing that they can do to guide you along the way? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Anyone can chime in? I think it would be. So like the professors I've talked to have always been like, okay, and like we'll take a second and then say, well, have you tried this? So always having like different routes to take, um, as well as like providing like other game plans or like plan Bs or Cs or Ds and so on and so forth. Um, like that's been really helpful to me in like my reporting and like doing these big projects and things like that. Um, but I think like we need more like faculty and advisors who do that. Um, who like know the legal channels to take, or who know like different ways to, to get the information you're looking for? Um, but my own experience with my faculty and advisors have been um, very helpful. Peter, you're in a unique situation. Because do you have a faculty advisor? We have, yeah, we do. But he's not like, you know, involved in like day to day. He, we we'll go to him like if we have sort of like ethical questions, but that's about it. Um, so. Not for anything like that, um, but I think one thing that like student newspapers struggle with is like because there's turnover like so quickly um, because people graduate or just like do other things on campus. Like there's not much memory of you know how to file a FOIA request, like or even that you can do it. So I think like to have someone who's there like longer term and just be to remind the current staff, to say like that these are the things you can do. This is how you do it. Like I think that's really helpful. I think just having like some sort of session with the staff about a FOIA would be really helpful. Like my faculty advisors are very involved, and and one of them was even kind of our point of reference for one of our FOIAs we did a couple of years ago, um, which was helpful. But I think just because there is turnover all the time, like maybe like before a week before the semester starts, when you guys are doing some training things, a uh, session on FOIA requests would be really. But I think I th would be really helpful for me. I don't think they're helpful for me, so. Um, I. Uh, leading off what you said, having um, faculty talk to, like if there's the editor-in-chief of the papers graduating this year, talk to them about how they should train the staff that's incoming to so everything's passed down from year to year so that the new staff coming in knows what a FOIA is, knows how to request a FOIA. Because a lot of the people that are coming in are current sophomores, um, some freshmen, some juniors that don't necessarily know even what a FOIA is, much less how to request one, uh, or uh, submit a request. Um, so just making sure that from year to year, the staffs are training each other, I guess, to, to know how to uh, deal with FOIAs. When you think about collectively your experiences that you've had with FOIA, what advice would you give students like Virginia who've never filed a FOIA before? What three pieces of advice would you give them? We've talked about sources, research, anticipating, but what really sticks out in your mind as the most helpful? Um. Rachel? <laughs> I, <was there. laughs> um, I don't know, I would say like be persistent and like be aware of the resources you have at a university. Um, persistence, like as we've like talked about earlier, and like, basically throughout this whole discussion. Um, you know, if someone says no to you, like don't take no for an answer, like find different ways. Um, but also, you know, depending on what university you go to and whether or not like your faculty advisor is involved or if you have like a media, like law and ethics class, like reaching out to people. Um, and also like we're in Chicago, which is really great because there are a lot of different people here who would probably be willing to help you. Um, so, and, and that doesn't even necessarily I guess depend on the topic of your FOIA or what you're looking for. It's all about like kind of finessing your own knowledge of this law, like what you can do and what you can't. 
Um, but I guess like persistence would be like the main thing I would go back to. Um, well, I would just say like, just to go do one. Like, uh, like you, you know, I had said this before, but just like go online, figure out what you can request, um, and like, don't be afraid to waste someone's time, even if you're not, you know, working on the story. Um, you might find something interesting. Uh, and then also, just like similarly, when you are filing a request, like, I would err on the side of uh, being too broad rather than too narrow in what you're asking for. Um, because if like you know if, if you have a, a longer time period, you might find uh, you know another case or, or more documents that you weren't expecting, but that are another story in itself. Um, and then you can always narrow it if, if it's too much. Um, know that it, I mean depending on which school you're at, but you're at Loyola, so know that there's faculty who are there to help you, and you might not know what exactly to do at first, but. Um, just know what resources you have around you to help you and that there are professors there who have done everything you're trying to do um, and that they're there to help you. They're paid a, a lot of money. <laughs> Professor Lamont or what's that? <laughs> 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 I'll tell you that. Um, I don't think he heard you. I made a joke. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I was making a joke that you were paid a lot of money. Oh, tons. Yeah. <laughs> Great day. Um, but yeah, they're they're there to help you to help you work through what um, you're trying to do by submitting a plan. I liked what you said about just going and doing one. I think that's just kind of the best practice you'll have. Like just try and just do like a simple FOIA. Like I'm looking for these things at this time at this location. Uh, if you're doing for the police department, if you're doing something else, uh, that might not be exactly the same, but. Yeah, just practice one. Just like, or even if you don't send it, just write one out. Like, look at Student Press Law Center or um, any other kind of format that you can look at to see how to write one. Um, whether do ones that you don't have to mail or go in person or just email it. Um, but yeah, just practicing them would be really helpful. I think. Is there anything that I have not brought up that you want to talk about or you think would be valuable for the audience to hear, based on your experiences? Form 990s are another great way, I think you brought it up, yeah. uh, to get information. You have your salaries, uh, the school salaries, and also you have like board of trustees. DePaul doesn't have their board of trustees listed anywhere on like, their formal site, so that's how I know who they are. Um, as well as like where money is going, like who it's going to. Um, so that's another great way to do it without ever having to interact with like a FOIA officer. Yeah, and, and nonprofits, so your college has one somewhere. Um, GuideStar is where we find ours. Um, so get a GuideStar account. Start looking for those. Um, they're yeah, they're super helpful. Seeing how money's allocated, it's it's helpful for us because it shows, um, you know, Columbia has a declining amount of revenue with their declining amount of students. So, seeing how they're allocating money to accommodate that is really interesting. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm just curious. Have you guys filed FOIAs outside state of Illinois, and what's that process like? It's a very good question. I am not. Is um, well, the co like <coughs> our newspaper, like there was like four of us, five of us, five of us that were involved. So I'm not necessarily sure how it was different, but we filed one in Washington D.C. Um, so it was like a federal filing. But uh, that I know of, it wasn't too much different. It was just uh, you know saying through email um, to narrow it down if it's too much. Um, but I wasn't too involved with the actual writing of the request, so I'm not too familiar, but I know that it's possible. Very good question. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Very helpful. Very, very helpful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.